seems everyone who has ever visited the Santa Monica Pier has a story to tell. Having spent over 25 years on the pier, I've certainly heard my share. Some stories resonate more than others, of course. Some are tales of great drama surrounding important events in the pier's history, and some simply transport you to a unique and wonderful era that you wish you had experienced. I'm Jim Harris, Deputy Director of the Santa Monica Pier Corporation, yet perhaps better known as the Pier Historian. I've had the great benefit of hearing the most fascinating stories about our beloved pier, and I'm taking this opportunity to share those stories, told in person, with you. Now, it's hard to even imagine this today, but over 40 years ago, we almost lost the Santa Monica Pier. With me today are Larry Barber and Stephen Randall, who were both part of the pivotal period in Santa Monica's history in which the community rallied to save the pier. Larry, Stephen, thank you for joining me. Hi, Good to be here. Now, Larry, in the early 1970s, you worked on the, in, on the pier in a cafe called Al's Kitchen, correct? That's right. Okay, what was Al's like? Al's Kitchen was uh, a hotbed of colorful characters serving halibut and chips and looking to restart uh, their lives, I think, and that was me as well. And when I got there, <coughs> I had come from Knoxville, Tennessee, where I'd been a television reporter and a radio producer. So I, I'd only known really like professional colleagues before. And so I was uh, jumped into the staff of Al's Kitchen and it turned out to be one of the most absolutely exciting periods of my life. And the, the people there were every bit as smart, every bit as savvy, just as ambitious. And they had the, the quirky uh, personalities to match as well. You may remember the, uh, the show uh, or the, the feature in Reader's Digest called My Most Unforgettable Character. It seemed to me often that uh, Al's Kitchen had uh, a candidate for uh, you know, everybody who worked there for my most unforgettable character. Just for example, Jack Sicking was uh, the manager of Al's Kitchen. Jack had been the manager of the Troubadour Music Club uh, here in Los Angeles, a very celebrated club for many sure. great reasons, sure. and also for the Hungry Eye in San Francisco. Jack was very autocratic and also uh, very understanding at the same time. Uh, he was a real fountain of creativity. Another uh, guy who worked there, Claude Bessie, was like a savagely flamboyant French guy who, <laughs> who uh, was just positive that he knew more about American pop culture than just about anybody. And actually, I think he did kind of know more about American <laughs> pop culture. Uh, so he was a very interesting guy. Later on, uh, got very involved and was a co-founder of Slash Magazine, which was a, a magazine that really helped launch the uh, pop music scene uh, at that time. Julie Stone was uh, a waitress, a very vivacious, uh, bubbly kind of personality uh, young woman who uh, later started a, a restaurant called 72 Market Street, oh, which sure. is a a culinary hot destination for a good while. Mm -hmm. Pat Lennon was one of our uh, uh, cooks, along with myself when I first got there. I was later a waiter. Uh, Pat uh, was this wonderfully open-hearted guy with long blonde hair. He was a surfer. He basically surfed there all the time, and he sort of got a job to kind of pay for his breakfast and lunch while he was out surfing. <laughs> but he was really great at uh, three terrific things. Uh, he was a great guitar player. He could make art out of wood, and he, had, he could make the best over-easy eggs in the <laughs> restaurant. Never broke an egg. He could flip the eggs, and they would come down perfectly, and you could never learn how to do that. <laughs> and, of course, he went on to, uh, to perform in the band Venice. And now, exactly, uh, he's uh, still very active. Uh, he and his, uh, his brother Kip and a couple of cousins, Mike and Mark, and they are the band Venice. A terrific band. They are. And, and Al's was owned by a woman named Joan Crown. Joan Crown was the owner, uh, a woman who uh, was here originally from England, and uh, just a delightful person. And I can still hear her voice uh, on my order. <laughs> <laughs> High-pitched voice. Fish and chips. <laughs> 
Very good. Yeah. Now, at that time that you, that you worked there, this was in the early 1970s, uh, the fate of the pier was, was constantly a, a hot topic for discussion among city officials. Uh, what exactly w was going on? Well, uh, <coughs> it seemed like the, somehow the city council, the fathers, had uh, come up with an idea for a 35-acre island to be built out in the bay. Originally, I think there had been an idea for a causeway to go from Santa Monica to Malibu, but that kind of, uh, those plans for that fell through. And then uh, they gave the city manager, Perry Scott, the uh, charge, the council did, of coming up with something to uh, sort of transform uh, the pier and the, the scene at the waterfront, I guess. And so they came up, I guess, with the developer for this uh, island idea. And it was going to be just huge. It was going to be a hotel. It was going to have 1,600 rooms. Wow. Uh, on the hotel, and I'm not even sure if that was the only hotel. Lots of other things that would go with that. And uh, the idea was they, I think they would use the pier even to get out to the island. So that all kind of floated into our life, and suddenly our lives were <laughs> in jeopardy if you were had a life on the pier at that time. Now, as I understand it, at the same time, the uh, the lease for the Newcomb Pier, which was the, the part of the pier that had all of the restaurants on it, was set to expire in 1974, and it had a clause in it that, uh, that said that they would have to destroy that part of the pier. If the, the lease expired, and somehow there was, yeah, there was a, an attachment uh, of a clause, as just as you're saying, that I guess if the lease expired, and I guess if they didn't renew the lease, then the, 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 the pier would be demolished. So. I don't know if that's where the idea came from, or they just thought, well, that sounds like a good thing. I don't know. Right. Right. Now, Stephen, you were a, you were a newly hired journalist at the time for right. the Santa Monica Independent. Yes. And uh, as I understand it, the, the developments surrounding the pier uh, were your first assignment. Well, it was certainly one of my first assignments. Uh, the, the paper was owned by a very uh, yet another colorful character. We're surrounded by colorful characters <laughs> in this story. A man by the name of Herb Chase, he owned the Santa Monica Independent chain of like seven uh, community weeklies uh, around this area. And uh, he was sort of an old fashioned liberal, uh, and he was an old fashioned rabble rouser, and he <laughs> loved a good fight. I mean, he was from the Hurstian school of newspapering. He would, he would start a war if it would sell papers. Uh, and he had the good sense to see this as a, a galvanizing moment uh, in uh, Santa Monica politics, and he was going to, he was going to take uh, the side of the rebels, and uh, I was dispatched as his foot soldier. I was uh, young and inexperienced and, uh, you know, easy to give orders to. Okay. <laughs> and uh, now at the time, of course, the primary source of for local Santa Monica news was the, the Outlook. Yeah, newspaper. I used to joke that we were the number three newspaper in a two newspaper town. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, yeah, the, the Outlook was a daily. It was very well connected. They had, uh, you know, the real journalists. I mean, I look back with some irony thinking that when I was at the Santa Monica Independent, my dream was to work at the Santa Monica <laughs> Outlook. That was, that was the big time. And the Santa Monica Outlook was very much a part of Santa Monica's political establishment, and Herb was very much part of the anti-establishment. Sort so of alternative press before there was an alternative press. So was the Outlook uh, supportive of the movement to save the pier, or? Oh, no, not, not at no, first. Not at all. Not at all. So your newspapers were basically battling each other. Absolutely. And I'll never know for sure, because he's passed away, whether Herb was on the side of the angels because he wanted to be on the right side or because he just wanted to strike a difference uh, between him and the Evening Outlook. Okay. Now, in, in all of this that, the, that was going on with the, the, what was going on in the city council chambers and, and with the city manager's office and the, the battle with the press over which side to take, uh, how exactly did Owls fit in? Well, that's a good question. How did Al's kitchen uh, fit in? Well, obviously, when uh, when the idea, of, you know, for the for the island came up, we started going to uh, the city council because suddenly, you know, enlightened self-interest <laughs> took hold. <laughs> <call, but laughs> and then Jack Sicking, as I say, who is the manager, he I think encouraged us but talked about it and we were interested and so it's like we wanted to see what was going to happen 
And so we went to the city council meetings. Uh, we would listen, and then uh, you know we would speak where you know if the opportunity presented itself. Uh, and then ultimately, of course, uh, you know there, there, we we started rallying people. We realized we needed to get the, a lot more people uh, to know about what was going on. And so we started a, uh, ultimately a, a letter writing campaign. It's hard to get all the, the sequence of the events because they were all happening so fast at sure. that time. But the, but the pier was a, a big topic and uh, we were interested and we, we had ideas, uh, but we were uh, vocal at the time and we were starting uh, letter writing campaigns to, to put pressure on uh, the city council to let people let them know that a lot of people did not want uh, the island and they didn't want the pier to be torn down. And they were the, the unofficial headquarters of the opposition to the city and so I was dispatched to go ingratiate myself <laughs> uh, to the crowd at Al's Kitchen uh, which, was, which was easy enough to do. This is good stuff, guys. We're going to take a little break, all right? And uh, we'll be right back. Welcome to the Santa Monica Pier. My name is Mary Pat Cooney, and I'm here today to offer you a walking tour of the pier, sharing with you all the stories that I can remember of its 100-year history. of American life on the pier. Welcome back. Now we left off talking about the, the development of Santa Monica Island and, uh, and the reaction within the, the press and within Al's Kitchen and on the, the pier and the community in general to this island. Now, um, on January 23rd, 1973, at a city council meeting, the city council met to discuss the fate of that island, which uh, had already received a lot of uh, resistance from, from the community. Now, it, it was anticipated that the crowds for this particular meeting would be too large to fit the regular Santa Monica city council chamber, so they moved the meeting to uh, the Santa Monica Civic Center. And Larry, can you uh, talk well, a little bit? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, there, I think there were about close to a thousand people showed up at the Santa Monica. So it was a great idea to move it because the council chambers, even with standing room, would not have held that uh, number of people at all. So we had about a thousand people. Lots of people uh, spoke, uh, including myself, but a lot of people got up and talked about, uh, you know, not wanting the pier to be torn down, uh, and they didn't want the uh, the island. Well. After as I remember, the upshot was then they, they finally voted, okay, to rescind the motion or whatever it was going to be, uh, what the action was, to not go forward with the island. So we a great sigh of relief, you know, sure. passed through all of the supporters who uh, uh, were there supporting the pier. A lot of people even started uh, leaving the building. We were walking out, patting ourselves on the back, you know, <laughs> and uh, that was really great. We did it and everything. And sort of like, almost like, you know, out of the corner of our eye and the corner of our ear, we hear something about a motion to tear the pier down or demolish the pier. And sure enough, the, the council was still in session at Santa Monica Civic Auditorium decided, okay, they, they decided to uh, not build the island, but they decided they were going to go ahead and tear the pier down. So that was a total shock. To oh, everybody. sure, sure. You, you walk out elated and all of a sudden realize that what you had uh, wanted to save was not going to be saved. Exactly. So, 
right after that, probably the, within, the, within the next two or three days, we uh, started organizing uh, probably at Jack Sicking's uh, initiation. Uh, we formed an organization that I was the coordinator for called Friends of Santa Monica Pier. There was another organization called the Save the Pier Businessmen's Association. I'm not sure if I have the title right. Uh, but two organizations, and we really started in earnest then, rallying support. And then we were, we had gotten the idea that the Santa Monica Evening Outlook was not particularly supportive, and that was really the only media voice. So we started sending press releases to every media outlet in Los Angeles, uh, and that was part of my job was to basically be available if any of them came to help them get a story out so that the uh, public at large would then become aware of what was happening and then keep this letter writing campaign and get people out and be active in opposition to what they were trying to do. Great. Now, the council met again on February 13th, 1973, and, and while there was still a great show of some community support, it seemed that every motion, there was a motion raised to, uh, to withdraw the, the proposal to destroy the pier. That was immediately denied. It didn't pass. Um, people went up to the dice and city council and, and pled their cases to save the pier. A petition was presented to the city council. It was determined to be invalid. Every attempt to, uh, to try and save the pier from the community or even from uh, the, the little support that on the city council that there was for the pier failed. But you were allowed to get up and uh, and make a speech as as chairman of the say the Friends of the Santa Monica Pier, and uh, you were allowed the time and you you made a very eloquent speech. Um, I've read parts of it, and you presented a, a document prepared by your committee. And uh, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little more about that. Well, <coughs> about three or four days before it happens here, you have a copy. I have it right here. There's yes. one here I see on this table. <laughs> How can you? Uh, priceless um, document. <laughs> Jack Sicking and I decided, sat down one night. This was his idea, but uh, he said, you're going to help me. And so we wrote this in one, one evening. It's not doesn't have a lot of copy in here, but it has a whole lot of ideas of what the pier could be. This is a brochure and booklet about uh, what the pier could be, because we didn't want to just be for not tearing the pier down, because we wanted to be for something. Yes, it needed to be improved. It just didn't need an island out there. So uh, he had a friend uh, who did the illustrations, and uh, Joan Crown took a mortgage on her house, came up with the money to print several hundred of these brochures. So we had those throughout the council chambers. I don't know if that was uh, what did it, or whether they were just afraid of saying no to that, or they were just so enchanted with my uh, compelling personality that they <laughs> wanted Definitely to hear me. Of, I'm sure yeah. that was part of it, or maybe Steve knows. <laughs> why, why did they? Well, it, was, it was so funny, because they were such radically... I had covered the city council meetings for a reasonable period of time before the whole pair thing happened. You'd be lucky if you got 20 people at a city council meeting, right. and they, uh, they would put you to sleep faster uh, <laughs> than Ambien. Uh, and what was one of the things that was fascinating was how uh, this became such an electric issue, so that you could have a 1,000 people show up at the Civic Auditorium, and the uh, council chambers would be, would be packed. And it was, such, it was such an emotional issue. That was the thing that made it so interesting, is that it really just seemed to involve people in a way that nothing that I had seen, and I was born in Santa Monica, I had never seen anything in uh, you know, Santa Monica politics uh, sort of electrify the city the way this did. And yet the city council, at, at, after your beautiful speech that night, continued with their plans to destroy the Santa Monica Pier. Yes, even after that beautiful speech, they still went right ahead. Uh, that didn't seem to make any uh, huge difference at the time. Now, funny thing about 19, the spring of 1973 is that was election season, and, uh, and three city council members were up for re-election. And, and somewhere, I don't know if it was in the press's heads or, or someone in, on the pier and, and the committees on the pier, but someone had the, uh, the great idea to uh, appeal to, uh, at least appeal to these council members, if not target them. Tom, do you recall? 
who, whose idea it might have been, or do you? Uh, I, well, I do remember that John McCloskey, who was then a city councilman, who was against tearing down the pier, yes. and also a close friend of Herb Chase, who owned my newspaper, uh, they uh, got together a slate of opposing candidates, uh, which applied pressure to the existing candidates. It became, you know, the issue. It was like a one-issue election. Uh, and I think that there was a lot of people trying to find some sort of weird middle ground uh, from the existing power structure because this was all very new to them. They had never had the city sort of rise up in revolt in, in this way. They were able, the, the Santa Monica establishment had ruled sort of without question for a long time. And one of the interesting things about what happened with the pier is it was sort of the beginning of the end of the Santa Monica political establishment. Uh, so you had uh, people who had been uh, for the island and for tearing down the pier suddenly trying to find, you know, backpedaling uh, like crazy. And then you had the election and you know the results of the election. Sure. So, uh, so the, the, uh, the target of targeting the council members obviously worked. The, the council met again and they overturned their decision to, uh, to tear down the pier and, and in effect save the pier. And, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, those three uh, city council members, uh, the incumbents, failed to win re-election. Right. It's and, too uh, little too late. Too little too late. In fact, not a single city council member who voted to tear down the pier originally ever won a re-election attempt. Uh, one, one passed away in office and the other, other four failed in their re-election bids. And it did, as you mentioned, change the change Santa Monica politics significantly. Um, so then in, in 1975, of course, the pier was landmarked, and it can never be torn down by a decision of uh, the city council, um, as had happened then. Uh, it, would take a, it would take a vote of the people for any major changes to, uh, to uh, the Santa Monica pier. Where, what happened with your lives after that? Uh, Larry, what, what path did... Uh, <coughs> well... Um Actually, during this entire period, this was actually a, um, I'd come out here actually to uh, go to the UCLA Film School, and then uh, some, some personal issues came up, and then that's how I landed at uh, Alice Kitchen, because Claude Bessie was actually a friend of mine, and he was working there, so that was the first uh, place I went to look for a job. But anyway, my, I kind of had a big spiritual awakening, and uh, all during this time, that was actually the, uh, another exciting pathway that was happening for me, and I ended up going into uh, ministry, went to the School of Ministry, uh, became a minister in the Church of Religious Science, had a church in La Crescenta for a couple of years, uh, was editor, associate editor for the Science of Mind magazine, and then spent uh, 20 years at Founders Church of Religious Science, uh, from which I retired about five years ago. There was a lot of pi uh, public speaking involved with that. A lot of public <laughs> speaking. <laughs> you were well trained exactly. by then. Mm -hmm. And Stephen? Uh, I stayed at the Santa Monica Independent for a while, and then I moved on. Uh, I had a variety of, uh, of newspaper jobs. I was a reporter at Women's Wear Daily. Uh, I was the articles editor of uh, Los Angeles Magazine. And then uh, in 1981, I landed at Playboy Magazine, where I've been for 33 years now. Interesting paths that, that, that uh, everything is taken. Very similar. Very similar. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> Almost identical. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and, and totally and completely unpredictable if you had known us at the time. Now, you mentioned some of the other key players, and in particular, Jack Sicking. And I understand he helped to uh, form the, the Santa Monica Historical Society. And he, he, he kept, uh, kept root in Santa Monica and, and focused on uh, preservation, as I understand it. That's right, uh, yes, uh, he, he did do that, and then uh, unfortunately passed away in, in the uh, thing mid, I forget the year now, but mm -hmm. I think the mid-80s, uh, he's no longer with us. So. But what an impact, yeah. what an impact that movement to save oh, the pier had. And, yeah. and uh, you know, t Santa Monicans today are obviously eternally grateful whether they knew about this or not. Um, Santa Monica would be a different place had it not been for the Save the Pier movement. And, uh, and that concludes our show today. So a very special thanks to Larry Barber and Stephen Randall. Thanks, guys, for joining me. I love your stories. And uh, please join me next time for more Santa Monica Pier stories. <laughs>